pray. Well, Lord, it's been a grand day. Uh, thank you for these dear brothers. Thank you for the fellowship we've had uh, together today. Thank you for the ministry of your word. Thank you for the time we've had in prayer. Uh, Father, we are like to ask another favor that you would just grant us uh, grace for this last hour in our study. It's easy to be a little fatigued and not concentrate as well, so we're asking for extra help. And we, we ask this because we, we want to learn, we want to be edified, encouraged, um, just to serve your son and love him more and more. So please help us, we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Uh -oh. Okay, I'm just going to go with, uh, I'm having a little trouble with the pointer. All right, so we're in the Gospel of Luke. And if you uh, would, let's look at Luke chapter 1. Luke is the only Gentile writer that we know of in Scripture, and he is upholding the, the theme of Christ's humanity, his sinless, his perfect humanity. And he is writing to the Greeks. Matthew was writing to the Jews. Mark writing to the Romans. Luke is writing to the Greeks. John will be writing to the whole world. And uh, not only is he a Greek, but he, he's uh, addressing this account that Theophilus, in chapter 1, verse 3, also uh, a Greek, and um, his name means beloved of God. And so Luke is um, a Gentile writer. Again, he's writing to a Gentile. And the first opening chapters of Luke, we have... Um, the birth, the baptism, the genealogies, and the temptation of Christ, or the testing of Christ. Uh, a lot of the similar information that is in Matthew, but with different emphasis, and obviously the genealogy is different, it goes all the way back to Adam, and Matthew was focusing on uh, the son of David, and so, and also the son of Abraham, following the lineage of Abraham all the way to the Lord Jesus, in uh, Luke's Gospel account, uh, the focus is um, Mary's lineage, and as Merce has already said, uh, she goes back to David through Nathan. Uh, the genealogy of Matthew goes back to Solomon. All right, so looking at um, some of the things peculiar to Luke, um, Gentile to Gentile audience, uh, only in Luke's account do we have uh, the Gentile flavor, the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, Mercer was talking about the Samaritans. Uh, after the Assyrians came in and carried away the northern kingdom, they brought in the riffraff from every nation just about into that area and brought in all their, their pagan idols. The Jews intermarried with uh, them in that area, and they became the Samaritans. And so uh, Luke records the, the uh, story of the Good Samaritan. He told it in such a way, by the time he got done, all the Jews were wishing they were Samaritans. And the Lord just had a great way of telling these parables. Uh, Christ's words, Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles. Well, we've been talking about that in the last session. Be fulfilled. And that's the Gentile oppression over the Jewish people. Uh, at the end of the tribulation period, that will be over, and the Jews will never be persecuted again by Gentile rule. Zacharias says that there'll be ten Gentiles hold the skirt of the Jew. They'll be the esteemed people. They're certainly not esteemed now. Uh, behold the fig tree and all the trees. Uh, Matthew only mentions the fig tree. <clears throat> Luke mentions other trees, other nations, Gentile nations. And I think I'm going to take just a little tangent here and kind of skip ahead and let's look at this passage because it goes along so well with what Mercer was just sharing. I was just kind of amazed, actually. Um, I was thinking as I entered the weekend, you know, what I was going to share probably wouldn't dovetail very well into much, but it really has, both in Mike and Mercer's ministry, as we'll see even more here as we get into the Gospel of Luke. So, um, the, shortly before the Lord was crucified, he took his disciples up on the Mount of Olives, and we have this 
dissertation, Matthew's chapter 24 and chapter 25, uh, a part of that is recorded in Luke 21. And Matthew gives us the most incredible description. As I said, you have signs, the beginning of sorrows leading up to the start of the tribulation period. Um, then you have the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist goes up in the temple. He stops the Jewish sacrifices, says, worship me. And that starts the great tribulation, a terrible time of devastation. Um, the Lord says in Matthew's account that if he tarried longer than that set time, there would be no flesh left on the earth. Uh, Satan knows his time is short. He's going to take down as many people as he can. And so we get to the end of um, the tribulation period. There's the, the second advent of Christ to the earth. Now, it's here that I want to pause. He says, um, so that's in verse 27 of Luke 20, uh, 21. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding and you see and know yourselves that summer is now near, so you also, when you see these things happen, know that the kingdom of God is near. That's when it's going to come, the kingdom of God. So it hadn't come yet, it's coming uh, with the second advent of Christ. And surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And so um, there's this foliage trilogy in Scripture dealing with the nation of Israel. The Lord speaks about the fig tree here, which I believe has to do with religious Israel. There's the vine, that's national Israel, and then we also have the olive tree, which is given to us in Zechariah 4, which is spiritual Israel. Okay, so that's the foliage. Um, the Lord planted, uh, Ezekiel talks about this. Um, uh, he planted this, this vineyard, a vine, and he looked for fruit, and Israel wouldn't give fruit. And, and so uh, God had a case against his people. He wanted fruit, and they weren't giving him the fruit. They, they should have been a testimony to the Gentile nations of his goodness, but they weren't. So what is he saying here? The fig tree is religious Israel, which, as Mercer was saying in 70 AD, that whole system was put away. And it's never occurred. Uh, in those verses that um, uh, Mercer read about there, there won't be a king, it also won't be a priesthood. Okay, There's nothing. And that's the case of where we are in Israel today. But he says, when you see the fig tree shoot forth leaves, summer is near. And the same generation who sees that happen will see the, the coming of the Lord in these things. All right? The fig tree doesn't bear fruit, but it awakens after this long dead time through the winter. And now summer, it's shooting forth leaves. And I believe that's the rebirth of the religious system. A temple Institute has already created what's needed through the sacrifices. There's discussion about rebuilding the temple. There's discussion about the, the ashes of the red heifer. All these things are circulating around. I believe it's going to happen very quickly. And we may see the Jews sacrificing before the rapture of the church. It may happen afterwards. But one thing that I can say based on this passage is that the nation who sees the rebirth of that fig tree that, that Jew, Jews sacrificing again will see all these things that the Lord has talked about. And that's, uh, if you think about the fig tree back in Luke 13, um, one of the parables, there was um, a landowner, he planted a fig tree, he looked for fruit for three years, no fruit, he was going to cut it down, but the caretaker said, let me till around the, the roots one more year, fertilize it so I can get fruit. Well, the Lord had already been preaching the lost sheep of Israel for three years, and they, there is no fruit. And the Lord went for almost a good portion of another year before he went to the cross. And uh, the fruit, the uh, tree ended up being uh, another time when the Lord was looking for fruit. He cursed the tree. 
and it dried up and withered away. So all these things are really tied together to the nation of Israel. Three plus years, he's looking for fruit, no fruit. When we see the uh, shooting forth of the fig leaves, I believe that's the waking of the religious reality. May happen before or after the church is out of here. I can't be dogmatic on that. But the same generation sees that happen. We be looking up because all these things are going to come back. And they're going to happen very quickly. So anyway, I just um, I was excited about what Mercer was sharing in the last hour. I just wanted to kind of dovetail that into our discussion on the Gospel of Luke. Anyway, Luke mentions the, the time of the Gentiles. He mentions the Good Samaritan. Again, this is a, a Gentile-flavored gospel. He's speaking to the, the Greeks. And as I mentioned, it's also addressed to Theophilus, um, a Gentile whose name means beloved of God. Let's take a look at some of the um, things that Luke reveals about the humanity of Christ. He presents Christ as the Son of Man. In Matthew, we saw the Lord being presented as the Son of David. In Luke's Gospel account, he's the Son of Man. John's going to pick up the Son of God. And so, for example, we have that title 25 times in Luke's Gospel, but only 12 times in John's Gospel. No one referred to him, addressed him as the Son of Man. He referred to himself as the Son of Man because it spokes of him, speaks of him humbling himself, coming from heaven, being born of a virgin, and becoming a man. He was the God-man. And so it speaks of his humiliation. It's a title he used to speak of himself, that he wasn't addressed as the Son of Man. It's interesting, we don't even find the, the title in any of the epistles, except in Hebrews 2, which quotes Psalm 8, and that's not a direct uh, quotation referring to the Lord Jesus. He was unique in conception. Um, I don't think this is a hard sell, but Luke says that Mary would conceive in her womb, and that is not the normal place of human conception. After fertilization, the, um, the fertilized egg settles in the womb, but that's not where conception occurs. Yeah, the fallopian tubes. Unique birth, born of a virgin. Now, in today's... <laughs> Today, that uh, is not necessarily a hard thing, but with all the, the technology and uh, some of the techniques that are used for infertility. But back in the Lord's day, uh, virgins didn't have babies. So he's born of a virgin. Uh, he has a unique nature. Paul says this in 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. Now, it's interesting, in the Greek text, there's actually no definite article there. It really reads better, God was manifest in flesh. Mike's been telling us about being in the flesh. We read in Romans 8, I think it's verse 8, whoever's in the flesh can't please God. Anybody been in the flesh this week? If you're in the flesh, you can't please God, right? It's only what the Spirit of God is doing with us, Spirit-led. But the Lord... Um, he was God manifest in flesh. Romans 8, 3 puts it this way, what the law could not do in that it was weak, through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So when you looked at the Lord Jesus, he, he looked like a, a normal man. He was in flesh. Um, it looked like the likeness of everyone else. Um, I don't think there was anything, there was certainly no sundial glow above his head. Right, uh, He was, looked like any other man. Uh, there was no difference. But he wasn't like any other man in that he had unique humanity. When Gabriel is talking to Mary in her home, he says, um, you're going to conceive, uh, give birth to a son, and he speaks of the, the holy thing that was within her. And I don't know how that's accomplished. Somehow the Holy Spirit came over Mary, took the raw ingredients, and I don't know what the chromosome level, whatever, every, every split, everything, the Spirit of God just overwhelmed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed. But there wasn't any of that sin nature that was passed down from Adam in the process. And so when the Lord Jesus was born, he's the first one on the planet that was holy humanity, right? The first 
man on the planet was Adam. Uh, God scoops up some dirt and he breathes in uh, a spirit into Adam and he stands up a living soul. And that's how the first man entered the earth. The second human to be on the earth was the woman. And God reaches into Adam's side. He takes a Tesla, really uh, translated side. I don't think it was just a rib. I think he took flesh, bone, and blood, takes it out, and there's woman, right? Not sure it sounded like that, but that's what <laughs> happened, right? And, and, and by the way, this is something I disagree with in the ESV translation in, in 1 Corinthians 11. Eve was not created a wife. She was created a woman who became a wife. Okay, and that breaks down the whole symbology that, that Paul's laying forth in 1 Corinthians 11. So, that's the second person who came on the planet, was Eve. A different way than Adam came, right? The third person, Cain, came through normal procreation. Uh, Adam and the woman came together. Uh, Eve actually didn't get her name until after the fall. God called Adam, they both came. They were, there was oneness, there was nothing separating them. Okay? So, the first three humans came onto the planet in a different way. Uh, Cain inherited that corrupted nature from Adam, and we've inherited that uh, down through the generations from Adam as well. The Lord Jesus came into the world in a fourth manner, and that is uh, the Immaculate Conception, where the, the Spirit of God came down and implanted the essence of the Son of God within the womb of a woman. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? The omnipresent, all-knowing, all-seeing, eternal, mutable God and constrained in the womb of a woman. He was born holy humanity. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 29 tells us that when Adam came into the world, he was uh, born innocent or upright, depending on your translation, right? He was innocent humanity or upright humanity. He had the capacity uh, to choose wrong. And then given in time, given Satan's deception, he did choose wrong. And sin passed down and death has passed down ever since. But the Lord Jesus is holy humanity. There was nothing in him that could, could respond to sin. Uh, in 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he knew no sin. 1 Peter 2, 24, he did no sin. There was nothing in him to respond to sin. He's holy humanity. So the first Adam, the, is, sometimes the Lord Jesus is called the second Adam. Scripture always refers to him as the last Adam. This wasn't God's second chance at, at making things right, right? The Lord Jesus uh, was holy humanity. He wasn't like his, the first Adam, who was innocent or upright humanity, who had the capacity to choose wrong, he was holy humanity. There's nothing within him to respond to sin. And fully tested, he shows that. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 4 for just a moment. It's so important that we um, hold to what Scripture says about the nature and the humanity of the Lord. Otherwise, we're going to have a demented view of of who he is. So in Hebrews chapter 4, we read this, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now look at verse 15. The last part of that verse, but we, sorry, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Do you notice how many italicized words are in that half of the sentence? Quite a few. I love the way Darby translates this. 
Um, he says that, uh, but it, when all points tested, sin apart. And that's literally what it means. In other words, he was tested in every way externally, every external solicitation that the devil could throw at him, he did, but not in sin. He wasn't tested in sin. There was no sin in him. So this verse is often used to teach that the Lord was sinless. He is sinless, but this verse goes beyond to say he was impeccable. He could not sin. And that's a dangerous doctrine to say, well, the Lord could have sinned. He could have choose wrong. He's holy humanity. There was nothing in him to respond. I was in engineering for a number of years. And uh, when you design something and build it and test it, eventually it has to go through some kind of a qualification test or a stress test to make sure that it's worthy. Uh, let's take a, a bridge, for example. Silver engineers build this bridge across the highway. It takes a lot of Canadian tax dollars. It takes years to finish. And so they're going to do a stress test. Well, the idea is not to drive, put so much weight on the bridge to collapse it, but you put enough weight on it to prove that it's strong and good and it is profitable. It can be used. In the case of the Lord Jesus, you could have put a gazillion billion tons on the bridge and it would never break right? He's holy humanity. There was nothing in him to respond to it. And so the blessing here is, is that the writer of Hebrews is saying, um, the Lord knows what it is to endure the contradiction of sinners. The Lord knows what it is to live on a sin-cursed earth. Uh, the Lord knows what it is to be rejected, to be persecuted, to suffer when you've done righteous. And in all those things, we can come boldly to the throne of grace and ask, oh Lord, you know what this is like. And he can sympathize with us and give us grace in time of need. But we can't go to the throne of grace and get sympathy for sin. It's insulting to the Lord. I would say Mike, Mike uh, Atwood and I, we're, we're good friends. We're going to take a walk together and we're going along the sidewalk in the park and I'm I said, Mike, I, I just want to tell you something. Uh, I haven't told anybody else this, but you're a good friend, so I'm going to tell you that this problem I have, anytime I see rocks, i got to just pick them up and swallow them. Anytime I see them, I just pick them up and swallow them. And he's looking at me like, and then he's like, oh, man, the cramping and the bleeding and the cutting and all that, and he's just shaking his head. Can he understand why I would swallow the rocks? No, he's probably thinking I'm a nugget short of a Happy Meal, right? <laughs> can he sympathize with the cramping and the consequences of that? Yeah, he can understand that to some degree. So it would be very wrong for me to come to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I, I looked at that nice woman in the red dress today and I lusted after her, but you've been tempted in every way I have. And I, I want forgiveness and, and uh, receive mercy from you for that. Well, that's insulting to him. No, he doesn't know what. It, he could look at the woman in the red dress and just say, I did a nice job. <laughs> he did not have a lustful thought. So this idea of the Lord's holy humanity is very important in that it relates to how we relate to him as a great high priest. If there's a matter of sin, the word of God's like a javelin, it runs us through. That's what we want. We want the word of God to bring conviction, to bring a correction, reproof, and all that. We don't go to the throne of grace looking for help in matters of sin. We go to the throne of grace looking for help in the matters of which the Lord Jesus can sympathize with and give grace. And I just want to, because there's a lot of doctrines out there, strange and even fundamental folks that are saying, oh yeah, you could have sinned. That's heresy. He, he's not only sinless, he's impeccable. All right, so unique humanity. He was holy humanity. By the way, so we're all born from Adam. Adam was upright, innocent humanity, but he sinned. He became condemned humanity, and that's the way we come into the world. As soon as we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and we're regenerated, born again, we become redeemed humanity. And we're waiting for the time that the Lord will return, call us up to the air, and then we become glorified humanity. 
right? That's a, that's a pathway. For the Lord Jesus, he was born holy humanity, and after the cross, he was raised up, he is glorified humanity. There's a man in the glory right now, sitting at the right hand of God in all that Shekinah glory. I think the only glorified man in heaven right now, the Lord Jesus Christ. Holy humanity. He had a unique life. Again, no sin in him. Knew no sin. Couldn't even contemplate sin. Uh, anything that the devil could have externally solicited him to do, yes, but that's external. There was nothing in his members to uh, respond to it. Contains a strong personal and human element in the Gospel of Luke. It's interesting that when God is directing Joseph, he speaks this impersonal revelation through dreams. But in Luke's Gospel, uh, we're getting the human side of things. So we have a, an angel speaking face to face with Zachariah in the temple. Very personal. We have Gabriel speaking face to face with Mary in her own home. Again, bringing out this personal touch. Luke records, um, Luke's record of miracles, teachings, and parables is more personal. Uh, when you're looking at uh, Matthew or even Mark, a lot of times they'll say uh, a certain one did this, where Luke brings out a man or a certain man did this, a little bit more personal, again, the human um, and that doesn't work. Uh, Christ is born in a stable, laid in a manger, Luke 2. Uh, no room at the end pictures the world's estimation of Christ, its condescension of Christ. He's laid in a manger, shows his utter poverty. Of course, we read in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, through his poverty, we might be rich. But the manger provided accessibility to all. Even lowly shepherds can come. If the Lord would have been born in a palace, uh, there would have been limited access. So God sends his son into this, this, um, this maiden, this uh, a pure maiden, and she has the son, but she's born, the son is born in poverty. But that allowed access for even those of the lowest social status to come and worship the Savior. Only Luke gives us the details of his childhood. Um, we read that when he was 12, he was sitting in the midst of the teachers, both hearing and asking questions. That's a very human thing to do. Luke 2, 51 tells us that he went down with them, his parents, and was subject to him. That's a great example for us to follow. Um, God as authority comes down to three categories, civil authority, home authority, and church authority. And we need to, to remain under the authority structure that God gives because there's only two uh, real structures of authority. There is God-ordained authority and satanic authority. And when we don't want to be under God-ordained authority, we're actually placing ourselves under satanic authority. And there's no blessing there. Well, the Lord gives us a great example. He remains subject to his parents. Uh, growth, Luke 2, 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Uh, again, the Lord didn't use his deity to cheat. How do you think the Lord learned to walk? How, how does anyone learn to walk? You fall, right? I think the Lord bumped his noggin. Uh, there was times that he, uh, there was pain and he cried out. Uh, there was no difference in his upbringing. Now, he didn't have a sin nature, so uh, I think his retention was a lot better than ours because uh, we have effects in our body because of sin that, that hinder our memory, hinder other things. But the Lord, I think when he learned to walk, he fell, he got back up, and it, he learned, he grew in wisdom and stature, just as uh, a normal person would. Except he grew in favor with God and man. And I think it probably was um, pretty clear as the Lord was growing up that there was a difference between the Lord and his half-siblings. Right? Uh, I have four kids, I didn't have to teach any of them how to sin. 
One kid goes up and pulls the hair of the other kid. What do they want to do? Pull the hair back, right? But can you imagine the Lord Jesus? They come up, pull the Lord's hair, and he might let out a moan, but he wouldn't retaliate in the same way. He didn't act like the other kids who had the nature, the fallen nature from Adam. So he grew in wisdom and stature, favor with God and man. He displayed holy humanity throughout his childhood, but he still had to learn uh, the same way we do, same way to, uh, to suckle, to eat, uh, to walk, first to crawl. Uh, only Luke records that the Lord was brought up in Nazareth. Now, Matthew records that they returned there, but only Luke records the fact that they, um, the Lord grew up in Nazareth. The Lord's ministry, Luke gives us the approximate age when the Lord uh, was baptized, received anointing of the Holy Spirit. Luke 3.23, he was 30 years of age. Luke, it's amazing, in chapter 3, he pauses and he gives us a panoramic view of the whole political system. He tells us who the patriarchs are, Tiberius Caesar, the year of uh, Caesar's rule. Uh, he gives us a whole political landscape. And again, uh, this is the, the political system, very important to uh, the human population. I already mentioned this, that Luke is giving us the chronological order of the temptations of Christ. Matthew is giving us the climactic order as related to his kingship, and that's why the order of those events are different. Let's look at Luke chapter 4. This is, I think, one of the most shocking things that the Lord did early on in his ministry. He goes to his hometown, he goes to the, uh, the synagogue, it's Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It says, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. In other words, when he's given the scroll, he didn't, it just didn't magically open up to the place. He's like us in our Bibles. We have pages, but we have to turn to the page. Uh, the Lord uh, turned the pages, so to speak, to find the place. He says this, and he's quoting Isaiah 61 here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recover covering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. In other words, he's saying, this is my mission. This is why I've come. I, I've been anointed to preach the gospel, uh, to heal, and so forth. But he stops mid-sentence in quoting Isaiah, because the rest of uh, that quotation from Isaiah, and the day of vengeance of the Lord. And so right up front, the Lord is saying, there's going to be two advents. I'm coming to seek and save the lost. I'm coming to heal. I'm coming to bless. I'm coming to provide what's necessary to offer you peace with God on my first advent. Vengeance of the day of God is later. He's coming back, and he is going to vindicate himself. He's on his father's throne right now, we read in Revelation 3, but he's going to come back and set up his throne on earth. So that had to be a shocker, really, to those who are listening to him. But he's clearly saying what he's about and what he's not about very early in his ministry. This is, a, I didn't notice this for a lot of years, but when Luke is recording the miracles, he provides detail that is not found in Mark's gospel or in Matthew's gospel. And some examples of this in Luke chapter 7, verse 12, when the widow of Nain's son is healed, Luke says it was her only son. And then when Jairus' daughter is raised from the dead, Luke 8, 42, we find out 
it was his only daughter. And then in Luke 9, 38 through 40, only Luke mentions that the father of the demon-possessed son was his only child. Well, if you've got five or six children and one is, is dying and you're pleading with the Lord, that's one thing. But if it's your only child, it puts on a lot more intensity. And so Luke brings that compassionate uh, detail out that it was the only son, the only daughter, the only child of these three families. Only Luke gives us the story of Lazarus and the rich man to fully manifest the, the state of the lost uh, after death. So in Luke 16, uh, we have Lazarus, the beggar. When he dies, he goes to Abraham's bosom, a, a holding place of all the faithful souls that have died up to that time. But there's a great gulf fix. There's also a compartment, which we refer to as Hades, in which the unfaithful souls are collecting and will continue to be collected until uh, after the millennial kingdom and when there's a new heaven, a new earth, death and Hades are destroyed. Uh, the bodies of the unfaithful will, from the seas and the graves will be raised up. Hades will give the souls and every individual, the, all the unfaithful will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. The books will be open. God is going to show he's very fair. And then... Uh, these will be cast in the lake of fire as an, exalt, an act of exaltation for the Lord as judge. We have an opportunity to serve, uh, choose the Lord as Savior or as judge, and these choose him as judge. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think I mentioned this last year. It's interesting in Philippians 2 when it says confess, every Mouth shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that's in the middle voice, which means they do it in and of themselves. If it was uh, the pass, if it was passive voice, that would mean God would force them to say it. How glorious the Savior must be when the most wicked people in human history, when they're raised up before the Lord, see him in all of his glory and say, He's Lord. He's Lord. Yeah. Must be incredible. Middle voice, they do it in and of themselves. They're not forced to do it. But it'll be too late for them, and they'll be cast into the eternal lake of fire. Uh, Mike mentioned this earlier, that um, Luke portrays the Lord as a man of prayer. Ten times in Luke's gospel, we see the Lord praying. And look with me just at Luke chapter 4 for a minute. I want to show you a detail. Mike mentioned this also in verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now Matthew says he was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, but Luke adds this point, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the spiritual man, right? He was a spiritual man dependent upon God for direction for, his, for uh, daily, uh, what he was going to do that day. He spent time as a dependent man in the presence of God. He was a spirit-filled man, and a spirit-filled person is not going to engage in anything that is against the Lord. We want to be spirit-filled. The spirit-filled man walking in the spirit, we're not going to fulfill uh, the lust. And so the Lord gives us this great example of being a spirit-filled man um, and a man of prayer. Lord refers to himself as the friend of sinners. He often ate with them, rubbed shoulders with them, was afraid of them. This is who he came to seek and to save. And so he spent time um, with those that needed a, a savior. Hopefully I'll quit hitting that before the end of this. <laughs> the Lord's suffering and death, only Luke records the following events associated with Gethsemane. When you read the... The details of what happened in Gethsemane and Luke, and you go to John's Gospel and read, it's almost like these are two different stories, right? So in John's Gospel, keep in mind, this is the Paschal Feast, so it's a full moon, a lot of light. Uh, you've got a whole band of soldiers, possibly 500 soldiers coming with torches and swords. I think they thought they were going to have to, uh, to scale and search the whole hillside for hiding Jesus. 
Well, he's not hiding. Matter of fact, he comes up to them and says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And what did the Lord Jesus say? I am. And they all fell backwards. They didn't learn because the Lord said, who are you looking for? And, you know, Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, the Lord um, wasn't shying away from what uh, the will of the Father was for him. He, he comes up to uh, this band of soldiers. He's, he's not hiding. And he's affirming his deity, I am. And so that's John's um, account of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now Luke, he records a lot of details that aren't in John. John records details that aren't in Luke. Luke is bringing out the human side, the, the anguish of the Lord's soul as he was contemplating Calvary. And so we read... When he was in prayer, his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling. We read that an angel ministered to him. Um, Peter takes a sword. He's going to take on the whole band. I think he was going for a head. He just got an ear. And uh, the Lord says, permit me thus, and he heals Malchus's ear. Whenever the Lord heals something, it's, it's better than what it was. And so Malchus lost an ear, but he got a better one in return. And I think of the Lord reaching up and touching that man's ear. The blood of that man's ear must have been with the Lord throughout the rest of the evening. Probably went to the cross with the blood of that man on, on his hand. The wailing women followed him. And Luke also records that he spoke to them and comforted them. And so Luke is uh, giving us uh, the Lord. He's He's praying as disciples are sleeping. The most critical point in the Lord's ministry where he really needed some encouragement is disciples are sleeping. And he's in agony. He's in prayer. He prays, if it's possible, this cup pass for me. But then he says, thy will be done, Lord. No hesitation to submit to the will of God. There was no other way. Uh, only in Luke uh, do we have the conversion of the thief. We're going to look at that Friday evening and, and talk about the dialogue there. Um, but that thief saw something. He saw the way the Lord Jesus was suffering and what he was doing as he was suffering. And he said, this is not a normal man. This is a righteous man. And that led to that man's conversion. He saw something very different from that holy man, holy humanity. And so Luke records that conversation, the fact that he would see him uh, in paradise. Wherever the Lord is, uh, is paradise. I believe that he went down to Abraham's bosom during those uh, three days before his resurrection. And then when uh, he was raised up, we read in Matthew 26 that some of the saints went in Jerusalem and showed themselves off. Wouldn't that be kind of weird? Uh, didn't we bury you a couple weeks ago? No, but it was showing something supernatural had happened, right? And uh, now, I, when the Lord raised up first, then that, that place, Abraham's bosom, is cleared out. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, ever present with the Lord. So Hades is still uh, gathering them faithful souls, but I believe that the souls now, if we die, our souls immediately go in the presence of the Lord. We're waiting glorification. Only in Luke do the two lowly witnesses give testimony of the Lord's perfection. In Matthew, we have Pilate and his wife, but in Luke, we have the repentant thief. This man has done nothing wrong, and we have the centurion. He says, certainly, this was a righteous man. The lowly uh, servants giving their uh, report. After his resurrection, Luke records this wonderful dialogue with a couple of disciples on the Emmaus Road. Uh, I would love to listen to that Old Testament survey. <laughs> I mean, the Lord, he, he walks up and acts like um, he doesn't know what's going on. And where have you been? You know, and, and he just starts opening the scriptures. And you remember the disciples, and when they're thinking about later, he said, didn't our hearts burn within us? Can you imagine having the Lord teach you as you're walking? This is a seven-mile trip. 
And uh, when they got to Emmaus, he made as if he would go on. They invited him in. The Lord is a perfect gentleman. He doesn't force himself on us. And uh, in the breaking of the bread, I think when the Lord broke it, they saw the wrist. And uh, they knew who he was, and he vanished from their sights. He was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. I love that. Well, once you breathe the atmosphere, resurrection atmosphere, you can't stay by yourself. What do they, what do, they do? They go all the way back to Jerusalem, seven miles, to meet with the disciples. We've seen the Lord. Yeah, we've seen him too. <laughs> it's exciting. He's, he's alive. He's raised up. He's uh, raised indeed. And so only Luke gives us that account. But Luke tells us that he walked after the resurrection. He ate food. After the resurrection, he also leads his disciples uh, out uh, to the Mount of Olives before he ascends. Now let's look at the last chapter of Luke, Luke 24. Verse 50 says, and he led them out as far as Bethany. This is after he's given them the great commission and so forth. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. That's Luke's uh, tenor, the human aspect, blessing, mercy. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them, and listen to this, and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Um, Mark has us, he was received up into heaven, and he's still working with his disciples. Luke says he was carried up into heaven. And again, it just uh, kind of is the crescendo to his view of the, the holy son of God, the holy humanity, um, the, the one who was... Uh, dependent upon the Lord, led by the Spirit, but we see his human, the agony, the anguish of his soul as he's going and contemplating the cross. Um, and he is carried up into the heavens. And so that's where Luke brings his curtain down with the Lord being carried up into the heavens, the Son of Man, now in the presence of Holy God. There's so much in Luke, it's, it's hard to know where to kind of... Um, what to investigate, what to speak to, but I'll just open it up for comments or questions. There's a lot of other things that could be shared with Gospel Luke, and if you have something you'd like to add, please do, and then we'll pray. Yeah. Uh, 